Hello, my name is Brock Davigno. Uh, these days I'm an interactive uh, television network executive, uh, Freedom Interactive Television Networks, but in 1977 I was uh, acting as a uh, uh, sound boom uh, assistant on a production uh, that was being directed by Tad Danieleski in a professional director's actors uh, workshop at the Brigham Young University uh, Motion Picture Studio and a couple of friends of Ted's had dropped out of the sky or at least the one was Michael Douglas uh, son of Kirk Douglas and he was a young fellow at the time and uh, he was at that time in the winter of 76 77 working on I think uh, some of the last episodes of 120 of a TV show called Streets of San Francisco with Carl Malden. And uh, this was in Utah and somewhere transiting across the country, they dropped out of the sky uh, to see uh, Tad because Michael Douglas thought well of his teaching and instruction and um, you know, across the board on screenwriting, acting, directing. And he wanted Carl Malden, who was a very veteran actor, to, to see this. And uh, the studio had a, on this end was sort of a brace and a doorway where Michael Douglas and Carl Malden were standing. And uh, in front of me, in the, the microphone boom, which weighed about 300 pounds and had a little platform and a big stand, a lot of this equipment was from uh, 1940s, 50s uh, motion picture studios, so it was pretty substantial stuff, which is part of the story. And uh, there was a entrance front of a building with a door um, and uh, a fireplace that could be seen through the door. There was a very large actor who was like seven foot tall, built like Hercules. And um, he was standing at the door with a pistol as a part of a hood gang uh, that was about yay big. And it uh, looked like, you know, something small in my hand, um, like a 38 or something. And um, there was a trussed up fellow in a wheelchair you know, by the fireplace. And um, actor Lance C. Williams, who was also a producer, director, writer uh, these days, um, was part of the Paw workshop. And uh, so he was, uh, he could play a quite a range of characters, good guy to Snidely Whiplash, in this case he was doing a villain, and he was a uh, bedecked, um, cape-oriented, uh, elitist kind of uh, hood gangster uh, chief. And the script had been written by students, and most of what Ted tries to get across is how to make a good script great using different elements of dramatic form. And sometimes he would pair up uh, actors and directors where they emote, uh, or the actors do, and the director and the screenwriters are evoking both good and evil out of them in conflict. So uh, he always was trying to improve and heighten whatever was written, whatever was acted, and this was essentially what he was doing on a typical day uh, that uh, these two uh, famous actors had to come to see. So the scene is played out where uh, in the script where uh, Lance goes forward and he, he kind of goes through the door and he uh, kicks the, uh, knocks the, well actually first he knocks the, the protagonist out of the wheelchair onto the ground in front of the um, you know, fireplace and then he, and in one smooth motion uh, kicks him. And um, all around bad guy. So, and this is flawless as the way the script was written. And Ted Daniel Lusk goes, cut, 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 cut. And uh, so, camera stopped rolling and, and so forth. And I uh, says, um, Lance, I want you to um, show your power over this huge hulking actor uh, and his pop gun, which is like you get this big. He says, I want you to take your pinky finger and as you walk in through the door, you push his gun out of the way. And in one motion, you attack the protagonist and do your kick. 
Okay, can you do that? Sure. Yeah. So uh, Lance uh, uh, struts in with uh, all the arrogance he can muster, and um, uh, he uh, think of an evil Dudley Do Right here, you know. and uh, so uh, he looks looks kind of over his shoulder and at the camera and. And uh, he looks over there and he walks through the door with some deliberation and pushes the gun out and kicks the guy. Off to my right, Michael Douglas says, See, Carl, I told you he was a genius. And I, I looked over and I, I grinned at him and I nodded my head. And the fellow on the sound boom, who's about a yard up in the air balancing this thing, is so taken by what's happened that he leans back and I realize that if this sound boom goes because it was the only one we had um, the shoot would be over uh, it, the, the microphone would be destroyed more than likely so this fellow hops off this thing as it's beginning to you know yell timber on me and I did something really silly I turned my back around and the weight of this thing in, in the boom picked up momentum and pounded me into the ground. L literally knocked the wind out of me. But I saved the boom. And so I'm literally breathless. I mean, this thing has just pound, hit me three times. Just, it just wiggle waggled as the, the, the boom came down. And, um, it, you know, it, it didn't remain on me, fortunately. Uh, and um, so, but I, I just was down on the ground and Ted Danieleski runs over to me and uh, he, he's looking down at me and he goes are you all right and I heard uh, you know <laughs> trying to speak and he, and he says you're okay and I, I'm checking myself and there's nothing busted and I like you know I wiggle around you know on the, on the ground and I was I seem to be okay I, I nodded and, um, and, he, and, he, and he leaned over and he says, don't you ever do that again. You're far more valuable than any microphone on the earth. You know? And uh, he says, I appreciate you being a hero, but not for this. You know, there's other things to be a hero for. You know? And he says, he's checking me again, you know, and I'm beginning to you know, pull up and Carl Malden and uh, Douglas are you know, leaning over with everybody else. And he says, back up, give him some air, you know, and I, and I stood up, and not, no bones seemed to be broken or backbone out of whack, and I've never had any problem from this. But um, anyway, I, I, I recognized something that had happened, and, and so he uh, said, let's, let's take a break, and, you know, we'll reset up and so forth. And um, so I looked over at, you know, Carl Malden, and he kind of gives me a thumbs up or something, and Michael Douglas um, looked concerned, and um, I was, I was, you know, kind of feeling things out still, and uh, I said, uh, yeah, he's a genius, but he cares, and uh, he goes, yeah, he does, and so he'd gotten in this habit, I think, in World War II, caring for uh, resistance soldiers against the Nazis, attacking Nazi trains or something, and um, that day was uh, an extraordinary day, but it, it showed me uh, what, that besides the fact that motion picture areas and television areas are always changing, therefore they're more dangerous than coal mines, according to insurance companies, uh, but you can always improve something. And uh, um, I was very bothered that this boom had gone down, but uh, the break was long, and, and uh, they went to talk with Tad and so forth, and, and um, talk with Malden. And I had always admired these actors, and uh, particularly uh, Kirk Douglas I had always admired. And so I knew that if his son was sharp enough to understand that Tad uh, could enhance almost anything and teach us how to enhance anything, uh, whether it's in words or acting or directing, uh, it, it was valuable. In the actors' workshops, you know, it was this was where it was done outside of a little practice area. With the writers, there was a horseshoe of chairs with a seat, 
and you were on the hot seat and this horseshoe of people around you are going to take Tad's lessons in improving any of 77 elements of dramatic form or comedy and quiz you on it and ask you how to justify where you're going with this uh, and how it could be improved. And it was a collabor like, co collaborative <laughs> exercise in, if you will, private property rights. And uh, not long after that, I was going um, down to California and there was a girl in the class who was very shy, but she was a very good writer. And she'd come up with an idea that she wanted to run past the uh, Edgar Burroughs uh, headquarters in Encino, California, and I was heading down there. And Ted asked me if I could advocate for her while I'm down there with her script. And she gave me permission to do this and see if they would be interested. And at about this time, they had in the works a live action Greystoke and a, a, um, a cartoon Tarzan with Disney and so forth. And her concept was very innovative. It was to be the grandson of Tarzan who was into ecology, whereas the son of Tarzan had gone city and urban fight. And um, so the grandson was a champion of ecology and uh, preserving life on private property reserves where poachers couldn't get elephants and so forth. And um, in this discussion, I mentioned that Ronald Reagan's best man at his wedding, Bill Holden, uh, had done with his money from some of his first films, the very first elephant uh, private property preserve. And it was very, the elephants were very well guarded. And um, uh, he says, yeah, I, I, I know Bill Holden. I mean, Ted knew everybody, uh, and everybody knew him. And uh, he says, uh, I, I want you, when you're down there, to ex explain that this extraordinary concept would uh, offer them many other opportunities, uh, even though it's very different, and it isn't in competition with Tarzan himself in what in the 1880s early uh, Burroughs formats and what it was was uh, that the linking of the generations would come together this way and um, I most of my life I had admired Kirk Douglas Michael's father uh, for championing freedom uh, the little guy against the big guy and, and uh, trying to not deal with, uh, say, corporations or uh, Roman dictators or whatever the particular thing he was doing, he ex exhibited a lot of courage that the writer, in the case of uh, Spartacus, was uh, Dalton Trumbo. And he was blacklisted as a communist in Hollywood. And uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a libertarian and all for the free market, but I think ideas need to be out there and discussed. And uh, I always applauded his father for doing that. And uh, uh, I wanted to tell him that, uh, and uh, that if he could be just as much as his father is from what I'd seen of his shows, uh, that, that he would do well, keep that in mind. And that was part of what Ted's message was, that you can show great evil. He had faced great evil in his own life. And you can show great good and it's not easy for the good guys to conquer the bad guys. If it's easy, why should anybody buy a ticket, if you will? How do they do that? And um, the high stakes, why should someone care about the, the plot? And um, I always thought Michael Douglas' uh, father had picked some great subjects uh, when he started his film company as a fairly young man. And as a boy, I had watched Roman legions uh, crossing the Hollywood Hills and my father stopped from our 53 Pontiac on the way to school. And he says, I think you'll learn more watching this than you will at school for the next hour. So we, we watched uh, Spartacus versus uh, uh, Roman legions. Uh, and it was uh, an idea that the epic could be there. And Ted taught us those things with uh, the greats Buster Keaton. He showed occasionally a film, and then we'd work that into all of the scripts we were writing or whatever anyone was directing. And he kept the actors and the director-writers separate. Um, 
he he knew the dynamic was different. A, a director sort of goes in between the two worlds, but um, he wanted that evil and good to come out of you. And, and if you could make them clash in a two-hour story for a motion picture, great, or 22-minute episode with a beginning, middle, and end, great. Uh, he, he taught us that. And I can, having watched the career my whole life now of Michael Douglas, I can see what made him a great actor was many of the influences of Tad that Michael took to heart. And um, uh, I was delighted to see things like Romancing the Stone and, and, and others in his early career. And he's continued to do these kinds of things. And um, his father's lived on over 100, uh, 103 before he passed away. And uh, was still strong in coaching kids, great-grandkids, and so forth. And I took an interest in the family. I read uh, Kirk Douglas's book, uh, The Ragman's Son and his own insecurities about being an actor and how he overcame those things. And he largely decided that, that he wasn't going to continue to waste his life with lots of women and he loved one woman the rest of his life. And um, I uh, thought there's a, in the play of morality and caring, whether that's on a set or in a scene that Ted conveyed this caring for the crew, for the audience, uh, for the story. And there's a lot of mechanics involved, and I later got involved in computerizing up dramatic form for him. Well, I worked with him. And I thought back many times to some of these practice things where I was a different role with sound or a grip or, or whatever. And I observed what he was doing and, and the people he brought in, many great names, sometimes uncredited, uh, to do that. So anyway, if some of the other students with Tad uh, have run across Carl Malden or um, uh, Michael Douglas, and Lance C. Williams and other actors that were at BYU, I think it would be wise if we uh, collected up from the uh, records office at BYU uh, for pretty much near a decade, all of his students at BYU get the admissions uh, office's cooperation at New York University as well as USC. And uh, mix and match who knows who and the stories will flow about these principles and ideas of how to tell a story between good and evil and make it the most that it can be. So thank you for this opportunity to talk about Tad. <laughs>